Hey everyone, uh, Tim here, and welcome to a brand new episode of Tim's Oregon Adventures. Um, so today I'm going to be heading to uh, uh, the Collier State uh, Logging Museum, just north of the city of uh, Chiloquin here in here in uh, Oregon. Um, I have visited this place uh, previously before. This was towards uh, kind of like towards the end of of, of 2020. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to see the the entire thing. Uh, most of the back half of it was completely blocked off due to um, uh, a forest fire that was in the area. It burned like the the back half of it. Uh, uh, some trees were burned. Um, there was a building that that got burnt and stuff like that. So um, I was unable to see the whole thing. Um, I'll be sure to put a link to that video uh, down below in the description so you can check it out for me. Um, and so that's where we will be heading today. So please follow me. Uh, okay, so I'm going to point out right now, um, from this point on until I arrive at the, the Collier State Park Logging Museum, there will be actually uh, no audio um, coming from this phone. I am using my LG Stylo 4 to record this video, and I was able to install a an app that actually blocks the microphone, so um, you won't hear like any outside noise um, or anything like that you were here um, like my car radio since this was a long trip um, I wanted to be able to play my radio without you know the possibility of getting a, a copyright claim so what I was able to do was install this app and it actually um, it blocks the mic which worked out um, actually worked out quite well so um, uh, I did I just want to say that um, also, um, <laughs> this was about an hour and a half drive from from Bend to uh, just north um, of the city of Chiloquin, which is where this um, this uh, locking museum is located. And I just wanted to say, um, if you want to see the beauty of, of Central and Southern Oregon, um, uh, please feel free to watch this entire video. Um, if not, um, you are more than welcome to, to fast forward um, through those certain parts. So um, just sit back, relax, and enjoy the trip. Thank you.
Thank you.
were the type that eclipsed the room I was the one who arrived too soon But no one would ever bet against us If they saw us exchanging glances I was too busy to fall in love You were too busy to break my heart Nobody else was there to stop us Nobody else was there to want us Now we go on and on with this poor love song We've been working on far too long, baby Do you still remember when our hearts turned up spontaneously? On and on like a marathon We keep running from fighting for something Something to remind us that we're better than this poor love song Too busy watching the TV screen Now we're just betting on broken dreams Nobody's gonna come and save us We cash in too many empty favors
I get to a fist, I got you mad. I guess that when I get to it last. Get it that I'm never going back. Get it that I'm never going back. I get to a fist, I got you mad. I guess that when I get to it last. Get it that I'm never going back. Get it that I'm never going back. Going up, going up, going up, going up, going up, going up. Get it that I'm never going up, going up, going up, going up. Different incomes, not one way. Living life on a one way. I knew this would happen someday. You can ask my day one day. Cloudy days turn the sun rays. Only way to way up way. Know my way, know my feng shui. I get to it first, I got you mad. I get that when I get to it last. Get it, then I'm never going back. Get it, then I'm never going back. I get to it first, I got you mad. I get that when I get to it last. Get it, then I'm never going back. Get it, then I'm never going back. I'm a different car keys. I'm the life of the party. I buy a bike like a Harley. Totally do so gnarly. God got me, can't harm me. I got armor and an army. Battle scars, battle smartly. Smartly, just forever like a sharpie. I get to it first, I got you mad. I guess that when I get to it last. Get it that I'm never going back. Get it that I'm never going back. I get to it first, I got you mad. I guess that when I get to it last. Get it that I'm never going back. Get it that I'm never going back.
everyone. So we are at uh, the Collier State Park uh, Logging Museum. I'm gonna go over here first. Okay, so this is this is the Clatsop fir. Okay, it says this 702 year old tree was located on Crown Zalabak tree farm outside Seaside, Oregon. And that's uh, that's on the Oregon coast. The tree was over 200 years old when Columbus discovered America. The diameter of the tree at the base was more than 15 feet and it towered 200 feet into the sky. The cross section on display was cut from a point 38 feet above the ground. Had the tree been cut into two by fours and laid end to end, they would have stretched from Collier Park almost all the way to Klamath Falls, nearly 28 miles. Douglas fir was designated Oregon State Tree in 1939 and is among the most important softwood species because of its great strength and stiffness. Along with lumber, paper, and other products used every day, our forests provide beauty, wildlife habitat, soil, air, and water protection. So yeah, this is a cross section of clots of fir. See the tree's birthday. 40, 1241. Marco Polo leaves Venice for first visit to China. 1347. Black Death or a Plague begins 50 year scourge of Europe. 1450. Gutenberg, Gutenberg Press produces volume printing of the Bible. 1492, Christopher Columbus was voyaged to the Western world. Now there's like um, different dates on here. Yeah, I think this is the most recent one. 1962, Columbus Day storm weakens the clots of fur. The tree falls November 25th, 1962. this bench it's all out of wood This way first. Blacksmith shop. See, the tools and equipment displayed here were commonplace in active logging camps prior to the 1920s. A good blacksmith was essential during days of horse and oxen drawn logging. Note that many basic tools, wagon parts, and even chains were hand forged in shops similar to this. Cool. There's a horse collar. Bridles. So cool. Uh, 
I'll go down here first. Struggle for profit, milling technology from hand tools to mass production in 100 years. Mills struggled to stay profitable because they were driven directly by supply and demand. The people in the mill town or across the state bought enough lumber to build their houses, offices, and stores. The mill succeeded, but only if it could produce enough to fulfill the need. Mill profitability fluctuated in response to world events like the world wars or the changes in construction methods. Improved saws and transport technology could all make the difference. By the 1950s, many mills had grown in size and in function, thanks to advances in milling technology. That's pretty cool. So, yeah, today we're getting to see more than um, what it was when I was here the, uh, the last time. So, that'll be nice. Yeah, this is an old sawmill right here. This is an old air compressor. This Worthington steam-powered air compressor began working in the Heinz Mill in Heinz, Oregon in January 1930. Its specific use was to supply air to the carriage dogs. These dogs secured logs as they were run through the band mill. The steam-powered compressor accommodates, accommodated three such carriages. Its use was replaced by more efficient air compressors in 1957. However, it was on standby until 1962. Yeah, it's an air compressor right there. And we'll go back. There's more um, in the opposite direction. <laughs> Old trucks. Oh, that's an old Mack truck. A very old one. And this thing right here, that's a, uh, it's called a high wheel. That's what they used to, uh, to move logs back in the day. It's another old, an old caterpillar. <laughs> Another few more high wheels. Yeah, they do have some work over there.
I already, I already went through this part in my last video. <laughs> Okay, so now we get to go this way. This is what I didn't get to see last time I was here. This was blocked off. So we get to check it out this time. Now this is what you, you see nowadays on the road. <laughs> These logging, these big, huge uh, logging trucks. Yeah, that's what you you see nowadays on the roads. So those old logging trucks. sign up here. Hmm, what's this? Oh, a, a snag pusher. Huh. This snag pusher is a result Rebuilt FA arch has been fitted with a 30-foot boom. A 500-pound iron collar with four large teeth to catch against a snag. Used with a cat to push snags over outfit. Has a 8-foot diameter iron high wheels with 10-inch wide tread and heavy iron spokes. It could push... Oh, excuse me. It could push over 400 snags per day. It was built around 1940. So this is a snag pusher. That is really cool. Yeah, like I mentioned before, this is the part I did not get to see last time I was here. This was all blocked off. But there was, they had a fire here called the 242 fire and it actually burned inside the logging museum. See, survival of the fittest, modern logging. See, the technology of logging. Engineering took the upper hand in late, in late 20th century logging. Both machinery and roads reflected the ingenuity in changing times. Powerful caterpillars, skidders, yarders, machines with grapple hooks, helicopter sky cranes and balloons with sky hooks enabled loggers to move trees from canyons and hillsides. New roads with bridges rather than, than culverts Heavy gravel or paving and special grades to prevent erosion were part of logging mandated by state forest practices law. New machinery worked hand in hand with new timberland management. Uh, workers, sawmill owners, and corporate investors confronted bad news in the late 20th century. The mosaic forest, old growth regenerating trees, and brush fields from fires were nearly all cut. The flow of timber from national forests dropped dramatically because of past harvest rates, set asides of wildfire wilderness areas, and impacts of environmental legislation. Protection for fish, birds, mammals, rare and endangered plants, and cultural resources contributed to the decline in logging and lumber manufacturing. The modern industry seemed like a bit like survival of the fittest. Those who hoped to survive had to adapt. Engineers tapped new technologies to make sawmills more efficient and to secure max, maximum yield in wood fiber. Computers calculated lumber sizes and lengths, laser-guided saws, special glues, laminating chips, and other cellulose into fiberboard. Thin veneers hatched for knots became plywood and paneling. Timber companies developed habitat protection plans and set aside protection zones along streams. Reforestation became essential for the company that wanted to have a future. Some saw the logger and mill worker as yet another obsolete profession. <laughs> I 
That's some really cool machinery here. Old, too. <laughs> Mighty McGifford. <laughs> oh, sorry about my shadow. Let's see, as the railroad became the prime method for moving logs to the mill, investors went back to the drawing board. The McGifford log loader was a result. A four man crew directed the McGifford to the log loading site where they straddled its massive legs on either side of the railroad ties. They raised its wheel off the track so empty flat cars could run underneath it. Then they operated a boom off one side of the McGifford to load the logs onto the cars. The 50-ton ton swing boom McGifford loader you see here could load 35,000 board feet of timber every day, enough for more than 30 two-bedroom houses. Hmm. Yeah, this is the McGifford. What did it say? Oh, here's, there it is. It was the 50-ton swing boom. <laughs> Turn to reach out. Pretty cool. pretty big. Wow, <laughs> the size of that chain. Let's go over here. See, crawling into history. The 1920s introduced the track layer or caterpillar to the US logging industry, a new invention by Benjamin Holt with continuous tread technology. It offered an efficient gasoline powered replacement for the heavy and dangerous steam tractor. <laughs> the most famous cattle up hitter was a 1930 Best 60 logging cruiser or Caddy Cat 60, named for its 60 horsepower engine. This 21,000 pound gasoline powered track style tractor could handle up to 3,000 pounds per load. Hmm. I believe it's this one right here. Hmm. That's what they had to use to move stuff around. <laughs> See power shift. Uh, the, the log truck. <laughs> uh, internal combustion revolutionized how lumber was transported. Automobile companies began developing log trucks as early as 1908. But by 1930, log trucks were a common sight. Fitted with heavy built trailers, they could carry massive loads to sawmills much more economically than railroad. 
The Mack Brothers made perhaps the most familiar log truck of all time, the 1916 AC model. The AC Mack had a 75 horsepower engine, widely spaced wheels, and a solidly built pressed steel frame. Produced from 1916 to 1939, the AC became famous for its tough durability. The Allies used the AC extensively during World War I, and the British named it the Bulldog. Let's see, uh, before Mack came out with its AC model, vehicles were sometimes retrofitted to transport logs to the mill. The quirkiest example of this trend in the Klamath area was a school bus with its, <laughs> with its seats taken out. The Mack AC was known worldwide between 1916 and World War II, but the Mack brothers were competing in the Pacific Northwest with several other truck companies including Knox, Kenworth, Packard, and GMC. <laughs> That's interesting. A school bus with its seats taken out. <laughs> you gotta be creative sometime, don't you? Yeah, uh, but what I was gonna say uh, before I came here um, in 2020, I've actually been into this logging museum before, but this was a long time ago. I think I was uh, oh, um, 2003, 2004, I believe. That was the first time I went there. Went here. Steam Revolution. I apologize if you see my, my shadow. See, steam powered entered the everyday world of logging in, in 1880 with John Deere Dolbeer's steam donkey. The donkey featured a vertical spool with cable wound around it. The logger played, played out the cable, attached the end to a stump, then reeled the donkey up the slope. Once there, he attached the cable to a log, reeled the log in, he pulled the log up for up to a mile. Let's see, the steam tractor. On the heels of a steam donkey came Benjamin Holtz's first steam tractor, Old Betsy, built in 1890. Its continuous track spread weighed weight over a large area and kept it from sinking into soft or wet ground. Its engine ran at a whopping 60 horsepower and burned wood, coal, or oil. It could haul 50 tons at 3 miles an hour. You see, the pros and cons of steam. Steam technology applied to log moving was far more efficient than animals, raising profits, ex profits significantly. It kicked the lodging industry into high gear. On the downside, steam machinery used up fuel and water and required constant maintenance. It sometimes caused forest fires. Most importantly, steam machinery was very heavy and accidents could be fatal. Hmm. Yeah, this is, uh, that's what this is, is a steam donkey. Walk down to this uh, this uh, river right here.
Ew, that's pretty. Wow. Yeah, I'm glad I was able to come come back. Um, I knew the, the rest were re uh, reopened after time. They just had to get everything all cleaned up first. Yeah, th I believe that fire happened in uh, September of uh, 2020. And I ended up coming here, I believe it was like a month later. So, yeah. Oh, another sign. I love reading these signs. Got some very interesting information on them. Oh, it's a <laughs> it's it's a grader. Ingenious grader. Faster, safer re road building. In the days of horses and oxen, moving logs to the mill meant building a road. The work was slow and labor intensive. At first, road builders used scrapers made of wood with a metal edge. He scooped up the dirt, but the driver had to get out and dump the soil onto the ground. In 1883, James Porteous invented the Fresno Grater, a new take on the old horse-drawn scraper. It had a C-shaped metal blade with extended rims called runners that tipped the bucket forward to dump the soil. The happy driver could stay on the grater. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that angle he's at. <laughs> See, to dump the old-fashioned scraper, you had to flop, flop it over upside down. I got tired of that. California farmer William Patterson, 1878. <laughs> uh, the Adams grater. 20 years, 22 years later, the Adams horse-drawn grater added leaning wheels to the mix. Its wheels kept the grater blade in the ditch easily against gravity. When the driver set the wheels to a sharp angle, the Adams bucket got into the ditch and threw the dug material up into the roadbed. How are you? Yeah, I was just uh, talking with uh, a park ranger. That's what you heard. It's a park ranger on a tractor. She's doing work out here, but she told me that um, they're actually um, getting ready to clue. So. I'll have to finish up what I'm doing. So we'll do a little bit of a walk. Now this right here is actually a, a village. So what I might have to do is I... <laughs> I might have to make a return trip, but leave uh, just a tad bit earlier. <laughs> so that's what I'll do. I'll definitely have to make a return trip. Yeah, this is like uh, 
kind of like a logging village is what these are. These little cabins and everything. Yeah, I kind of I kind of left a little late, so that's what ended up happening. So I left earlier. <laughs> I didn't know they closed until four. And so I'll, I'll be sure to do that. I'll, I'll have to make sure I. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll try to make a return trip. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? So that was my tour of the Collier Memorial State Park Logging Museum, um, just north of the town of Chiliquin, um, which is actually right across the road from um, the state park where they have uh, campgrounds. Um, th that is a very um, cool place. I'm glad I actually went to, to go back to see um, the rest of the stuff that I missed the last time I was there. Um, a lot of um, history with anything to do with logging. Um, they had old um, tools, um, logging equipment, anything like that it was a really cool place. So if you're a logging fanatic or you knew, know somebody that likes, that's interested in that kind of stuff, maybe somebody that actually did some logging, um, I highly recommend you go there. I would be sure to uh, put a picture uh, of exactly where this logging museum is located, so you can um, you can find it. Um, as you may have noticed, um, like right towards the end of the video, I, I kind of had had to rush it a little bit. Um, I actually uh, met up with a park ranger that was telling me that they were just getting ready to close. I had to kind of rush through that last little part there, so. Um, but even though I said in the video that I might, um, I might have to come back and do a revisit, um, I was able to see most of it, so um, um, I'm pretty much going to call it good. So, but yeah, if you're ever in um, the Southern Oregon area, like I mentioned, uh, um, please stop by there. Um, you will love it. But. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you, uh, be safe, and God bless.